Hush money. Hush money. New York election interference. Hush money. So this is about to happen. The weather report is stormy with a chance of incarceration in New York City (laughs) next week. Hello, everyone, and welcome to George Conway Explains It All to Sarah. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark. And because I'm not a lawyer, I've asked my good friend George Conway from the Society for the Rule of Law to explain today's legal news to me and to you. Where can I get my Bulwark thing? Barry will get you one. Okay. I just want one. Uh, One for my house. So before we get to the legal news, I want to remind people that we are hosting a live taping. You, me, Sixth and I. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tickets are still available. There will also be a Next Level podcast. Me, JVL, and Tim. I'm pulling double duty that night. Tickets are still available, and we would love to see you there. And if any of you are fans of the Next Level and are in Philadelphia, we will also be doing a TNL Live in Philadelphia on May 1st. Go Birds. Yeah, go birds. Uh, we announced last week we're also selling George Conway's hats at store.georgeconwayexplains.com. If you store want dot? I don't know who made that up. <laughs> Genius. Genius. This is the same person who did, like, discount George 15. And- <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, real quick before we talk to legal news, uh, O.J. Simpson just died yes. just before we walked in here. Yep. Uh, and it... Brings back memories. It does. Where were you on that case back then? Were you just an observer? Or? I was a lawyer. And I remember I was a young lawyer at, at, in a New York law firm. I had just made partner. And I remember being at home that a little bit early that Friday evening. And I remember, I think the NBA finals or the NBA playoffs were on and all of a sudden there was the, the slow speed ch- car chase was going on. It was yeah. very, very bizarre. And did you, as a young lawyer, was it like a parlor game to critique the prosecution and the defense because it was such a high profile televised? You know, it, it, I, I, I don't remember, you know, gaming it from day to day. Mm-hmm. I, didn't, I didn't watch it every day. Uh, but I mean... I mean, the feeling always was that they overtried the case. But the biggest thing that they did that was was problematic for them, as I recall, was that they decided to bring the case downtown. They could have brought it. You know, he lived way out in in, in what is it, Westwood? What do you, what do you call that area? It was I don't very know. Uh, very fancy um, Brentwood, Brentwood. Oh, Brentwood. And there's a courthouse out in out in West LA somewhere, and you get a completely different jury pool. Then you do get downtown, and and by but they brought the case downtown because the DA Gil Garcetti wanted to be able to be in front of the press as much as possible, and that's where his office was. So and so he made that decision, Garcetti, who was I believe so. If I'm not mistaken, I believe that's the reason why the decision was made. I mean, I think they probably they probably kind of dressed it up with well, uh, the pre- there's going to be so much press there, and there's better security there, and yada yada yada. But they they sacrificed. They got a. They got they they got a pool that was not as good for them a jury pool that was not as good for, for them, and that might have made the difference. But we uh, who knows? But they overtried the case, no question. Yeah, uh, man, that is like one of my first memories of something. I'm afraid big to ask. How and, old were you? Well, I were, they wheeled a television into our uh, cafeteria. Uh, well, I want to say maybe I was like a sophomore in high school. Oh, that's not terrible. Yeah. Uh, you were old enough to uh, see the blood and gore. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember. It was very divided, like, because they, they rolled a TV in, announced the verdict, and, like, half the I think they tore the cheered. house down. I think somebody bought the property, the, the OJ's house, and then tore it down and built another house there. It uh, probably had some bad juju. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I mean, remember the, remember the Cato Caitlin? Um, Cato Caitlin. Caitlin. Is that it? Cato Caitlin. Is that? I can't remember. I do remember. Remember, he was, he was the guy. He lived in this... Um, there was like this little, pit, like, a, like a little shack on, yeah, on the side right. of the property. Yeah. And he became like this central figure. He became the sort central of this figure because the dude. question is whether, because one of the gloves, I think one of the gloves was behind there or something. I don't know. One of the bloody gloves. And God, uh, that was crazy. The well, funniest thing, though, the funniest thing was a friend and I went skiing in the summer of 1995. It was till August of 1995. A friend and I went skiing in San Carlos de Barloche, which is in sure. Argentina, in the Andes. It's the only place you can go skiing in the summer. 
And I remember thinking on the 12 hour flight to Buenos Aires, and then there was like a two or three hour flight to Better Watch, thinking, oh, great, no fucking OJ for the, for the week. Don't have to listen to any OJ. Go into the hotel, turn on the TV, and it's CNN and it's OJ. All day long. I was like, I couldn't believe we're, 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 we're three, five, five, I don't know how many thousand miles away. I mean, it was just crazy. And uh, um, it was quite yeah. a week. You know, it reminds me, I don't know if this is even, but, but like, there's Trump, there's Trump elements yes. in all of this for some reason. Like, it culturally, it feels. Well, uh, because you both, but they're both sociopaths. Yeah. They're both sociopaths. They're both, both pathological liars, but they're, they can be very charming. And, um, famous, famous, and then- charming, manipulative. I mean, they're very, very, very similar characters. And, and, and. Um, you know, OJ went and said and went out and said that he he's going to look for the the real, real killers. killers. I mean, then wrote know, a book. If then he I wrote did a book. It. If I did it, you know, tr- Trump. Trump. There's a little bit of Trump in him. Yeah, a lot of Trump. Okay. Actually. Speaking of Trump, Mar-a-Lago. We talked about Trump's motion to dismiss right. the classified documents under the Presidential Records Act. Right. And then, like an hour after we finished right. recording, Cannon issued her ruling. I, I'm, I'm, I've lost track of the dates, but yeah. Right. He was trying to dismiss his motion to dismiss was around like I can just declassify this in my mind. They're right. they're in my possession. That no, whole yeah, thing. That, right. All right. So what did her doing that? Because we talked about that for a long time last episode, and then she did it. She dismissed it. What does that say to you? Well, I mean, I think the problem is that I mean, with respect to the Presidential Records Act. Well, frankly, with any defense that he's got, the problem is that um, she didn't necessarily say these things, these these matters are gone as a matter of law um, from the case. And, and that's particularly true of the Presidential Records Act issue that, that we discussed last time. If she resurrects that issue during trial and directs a verdict in favor of the defendant, um, there's no way to appeal that if it's during the trial, if it's after the, ju- the jury has been sworn. And that is sort of the problem. That is that is a problem that Jack Smith faces is that, yeah, he, he won this motion to dismiss, but there's language in the PRA motion to dismiss that basically says that, oh, well, you know, I, 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 we can revisit this at trial depending on the evidence. And the fact of the matter is, as, as, sh- as he pointed out in those jury instructions that we read through last week, there is no basis for dismissing this case um, under the Presidential Records Act. There is no basis for even mentioning the Presidential Records Act in this trial because it is completely irrelevant to the question of whether or not he took national security documents um, out of the possession of the United States government. And there is no basis to conclude under any law that the, that the, that the materials belong to him in any, any way, shape, or form. So um, the way, the, the, the problem that Smith has is he needs to cut her off at the pass and the way she's he's probably going to have to do that is he's going to have to make what's called an in limine motion and an in limine motion is a motion that you make before trial to ask the judge to say that something is off limits whether it be a piece of testimony or whether it be a legal argument something cannot be brought in front of the jury because if it's brought in front of the jury and you you can't fix it after you bring it out in front of the jury and that's the way and and judges are supposed to decide those cases before trial civil or criminal you can make these motions and if she refuses to say that the presidential records act is um is um out of bounds um then he can take that up and maybe get her removed from the case. She, he's he's got to take a, some shot at getting her out of the case, I think, um, because she's just she's just a disaster for him. Well, so this was sort of the question I had is, because is, she, my understanding, both from you and then from other people that I read around this. You talk to other people? You're two-timing I mean, me? It's like Twitter. And Twitter, I mean, the Twitter lawyers. I follow some of the other Twitter lawyers. I'm so sad. And, I'm and, cry. And, they, you're still the best one. You're my oh, favorite. Thank you, thank you. So they seem to be suggesting, or they were saying, okay, but the way this is written, she's not cutting off the opportunity for right. them to bring it up in court. All right. Could she have? Yes, I'm she not- could have done the right thing, and she basically could have said that the President of Rutgers Act has nothing to do with this case. It doesn't have any bearing on the case, and there's no basis to dismiss the and case. And that would have knocked it out right from there. Yeah, okay. although, although, you know, and in, 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 there's nothing that would have prevented her from bringing it back somehow mm. but she but she could have made clear what her position was yeah and she didn't do that and 
because the argument is so clear that the PRA doesn't have any impact on this case, you have to ask, why did she do that? Okay. And there, one theory would be she's looking for a way to fix the case for him, or another would be she's just not very smart, or, th- you know, or she's just being or cautious. She's helping or she's helping him being, delay things by uh, saying, like, now he's going to have to, the in liminal, whatever. It, it, well, I mean, in limine motions really in and of themselves wouldn't delay the case because they're always made. There's okay. always going to be okay. both in any sp- you know, in any civil or criminal case, there are going to be some in limine motions made beforehand where, you know, I you can't cross-examine my guy about his relationship with his dog or something, you know. Mm-hmm. Anything, okay, whatever. that makes sense. There's always something that's that, that some one side is sensitive of and, and is going to argue doesn't have any bearing on the case. Yeah. There was also the thing last week where you were reading, you had sort of read Jack Smith's um, response to right. Cannon. And you were sort of like, "This is hot fire from a from a lawyer," and I was like, "Okay, because yeah, you know, okay, it's like but, it's hot fire. It's like it's just like notwithstanding the foregoing." <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh God, he said notwithstanding the foregoing. You were like, and "Man, this guy really is going excited. tough." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but it sounds like if I uh, read it, so read viewers, the response, so view, viewers okay. called in and said, "What's he talking about? Why is it <laughs> no, 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 it's notwithstanding?" Too. I didn't even know what that means. But, I mean, you know, no, the, our viewers are, are very, very smart, very bright. actually, um, but. So going. Jack Smith, he did go hard at her, though, as you were saying, essentially yep. demanding that Judge Cannon hurry up and decide yep. some of these questions. Uh, and in this order, she sort of responded to him and said, to the extent the special counsel demands an anticipatory finalization of jury instructions prior to trial, prior to a charge conference, and prior to the presentation of trial defenses and evidence, the court declines that demand as unprecedented and unjust. Again, Hard to, you know, parse, but that sounds like she's saying, hey, man, back off. We'll do what we want. Right. But the thing about that, hey, man, back off is she raised the issue in the first place. She's the one who said, hey, guys, let's draft some jury instructions. So he basically says, OK, we'll draft jury instructions. Um, but if you really are considering this kind of jury instruction, let us know. And, and, you know, that that's a fair response to the fact that she did this unbelievably bizarre thing of asking for jury instructions that are contrary to the law this early before the before the before the trial. Um, so, so you she, don't think that it's backfire. The fact that he went so hard is backfire. No, I, I, no. I don't think so at all. I mean, I think that that, you know, I mean, I think she actually looked kind of foolish to take the special counsel to task for simply responding to some a bizarre request that she made. No, no judge ever, ever asks for alternative jury instructions this early um, before the trial right. in a situation where the where the legal issues are you know are being de- dis- are being dis- are being litigated on a motion to dismiss and where the premise of the instructions the premise of the instructions that she's asking for is completely absurd and contrary to law as demonstrated by the briefs so you know she kind of walked into that yeah. as, she, as she is wont, wont to, do. to do yeah uh, so another ongoing fight in this case is about how much of the information should be redacted uh, versus how much gets disclosed, particularly about witness names. And so Jack Smith has argued for redacting witnesses' names. Trump has taken yeah. the opposite position. I assume Jack Smith wants to protect witnesses from intimidation and harassment from the MAGA crowd, and Trump wants to chill witness testimony. So what happened this week on that question? Oh, something absolutely amazing. And I think the best takedown of it. I I read her opinion and I didn't understand what her complaints were about the special counsel on this. But there was a very good takedown of it in Above the Law, which is a legal blog. Um, There's a lot of... It's my favorite legal blog. It's pretty good. And and it it, it just... Here's what happened in a nutshell. The too long don't read. The defense makes this over-the-top motion that basically says that the entire case is a conspiracy against Trump and that every arm of the government is involved and that therefore they should get discovery of all sorts of branches of the government. And in support of their motion, they file a whole pile of stuff of discovery material. And they don't, they propose not to redact it. 
The government responds and said, oh, this is a dumb motion, but you know, they've got a lot of discovery stuff in here. You can't let that, you can't let that stuff become public. And it was like a perfunctory four-page response. And a normal judge would have said, of course not. This is all grand jury material. There's a, there are federal, there are federal rules of criminal procedure. You don't put all this discovery stuff and grand jury material out on the public docket. It's standard for it to be, to be, to be redacted and not published beforehand. Now, if it's during a trial, that's a different standard. There's a First Amendment issue that's involved and a much stricter standard applies because because uh, it, you know there's a presumption that trial proceedings are public but if it's discovery and and, and in particular grand jury materials which are ex explicitly made confidential under rule 6c of the federal rules of criminal procedure y you don't put that stuff out there so she grants essentially says to the to that she's going to put this stuff out there and at that point, Jack Smith makes a motion for reconsideration saying, whoa, you, you can't do that. And, and they write a whole big, long brief about it. And then she realizes they're right. And then she writes an opinion saying, well, the problem here was that Jack Smith didn't point this out to me in the first set of papers. Well, the problem was they thought you were a federal judge judge and they thought you knew the obvious, which is what they were saying is you can't let this stuff go public. I mean, it goes, you know, I mean, it's like, like I, I never practiced criminal law. I never tried a criminal case, but I know that, you know, grand jury materials are secret. And when you file them in court, they are secret and you have to file them under seal. But this judge didn't, you know, couldn't figure that out. It was really quite remarkable. And what's remarkable about this judge is this isn't the first time she's done such bizarre things. Obviously, in this case, we've talked about the bizarre things she did, but she apparently, one of the one of the strikes against her before she even got this case was she um, had a criminal case. She's only like tried four criminal cases, apparently. And one of the criminal cases, one of the things you can do in, in, a, crim, in a criminal or civil case is you can ask the jury questions that are subsidiary to the ultimate question of guilt or innocence. Do you find this element? Do you find that element? Do you find that? And that can be useful in understanding the verdict. And, 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 and sometimes you are allowed to put what are called special interrogatories to the jury in addition to a general verdict. And it can be helpful um, because sometimes the elements of, of a crime, like particularly the RICO case or something like that, or you, the elements can be complicated. You want to know the jury went right through it in, in the correct fashion. Um, she did that. She gave the jury special interrogatories. But she apparently did not give the jury the ultimate question, do you find the defendant guilty or not guilty, which mm. is an absolute positive requirement for a jury questionnaire, a verdict sheet, which is sort of like, it's like going to a travel agent and saying, hey, I want to go to Bermuda. And the travel agent gives you drink tickets, but not the actual airline ticket. Yeah. <laughs> so this, this woman has her issues with, on you know, uh, as a federal judge, even apart from the fact that she seems to be favoring Trump. Okay. And so, so basically, Smith has to make the case now for each witness redaction, right? Like, sort of isn't what she sort of said that, like, you can do some redaction, but uh, you're going to have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis? Yeah, but I don't think that's going to be hard for the, no. for the prosecution. I mean, you, you know, you can... I mean, this this stuff is presumptively okay. not okay. available. Good. All right. So I haven't followed uh, ever in my life uh, litigation as closely as I have in these cases, and I continue to be surprised how many different legal issues there are to fight about. Uh, this case isn't just about whether Trump was, this is like sort of what you were just talking about. Trump was wrong to have the classified documents right. in Mar-a-Lago. They also have to argue about jury instructions and witness redactions and seemingly a million different things. Yeah. Is this normal in a trial or is yeah. this a delay tactic by trump no there are i mean there are delay tactics I mean, trump is making everything more difficult i mean you you can see it for example in the new york case where he's basically going up to the appellate division every single day with a new frivolous motion to stop the trial he is absolutely doing everything he can to create complexity that being said there's always there are always these subsidiary issues in trials particularly white collar cases um, and you know, and this one, this one in, in Mar at the Mar-a-Lago case involves 
uh, classified documents, and there's a whole statute that applies um, on 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 how those documents are handled both before trial and at trial, which is particularly tricky because it's a, you know trials are public. Yeah. So no, there there are there there are going to be subsidiary issues like that, and you can end up with um, dockets that have like hundreds of entries before the case even goes mm-hmm. to trial, and that's that's not unusual. What's unusual in the Mar-a-Lago case is that she doesn't seem to be able to handle all of that with dispatch. Yeah. Like, and these are easy to know, check off. Some, some, yeah, she's making things more complicated for herself, and she's getting she's falling behind. Um, so got it. And okay. they're not they're the Trump people aren't helping, obviously. They wanna they wanna make this, they wanna create as many issues as possible. And and she's showing a tendency to take every single thing very seriously that they say, even when they are saying completely absurd things. So, you know, so in other words, instead of she, she instead of just saying this motion is frivolous, it's denied in a in a one paragraph order, she'll hold a day of oral argument and then write a write an opinion and just take time with it. Yeah, and cause all of us to have to, you know, have follow podcast every twist after and podcast, turn yeah. and do podcast, which brings me to paying some bills here because this episode is sponsored by our friends at BetterHelp. And George, let me tell you, Following all this legal stuff, it has my social battery running kind of low lately because my schedule has been packed super full. And it's only going to get crazier as the year goes on. It will get crazier. And I'm sure plenty of our listeners' social batteries are drained too because it's so easy to spread ourselves too thin, especially with social events picking up after the winter. That's why it's really important to know when you're reaching your limits socially and how to recharge. Therapy can be a great way to build in that self-awareness. How's your social battery today, man? Oh, good. Pretty charged up. Yeah? Pretty good. How do you keep yourself generally from burning out? Dogs. Dogs. They give you, like, life and energy. Dogs, yes. They give me energy. That's a good one. You should get a dog. Dogs are good. My cat is... She's cool, but I don't know that she's, like, giving me life. Cats. Okay, I'm not going to... Wait, we're not going to disparage cats. We're going to have a... No, no, no. No, no no disparage. All right. They are different than dogs. If any of our listeners are considering starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. You don't have to go anywhere. You can stay with your dogs. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your social sweet spot with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash AskGeorge today to get 10% off your first month. That is BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash ask george just out here helping people with their getting their mental health back on track okay yes ma'am hush money hush money new york election interference hush money so this the is about to happen is stormy with a chance of incarceration in new york <laughs> city next week <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, yeah. How many stormy puns are we going to get from you on Twitter? Uh, yeah, I just have to be careful. There are things I could refer to that I will, you know, get in trouble I for. I will be keeping an eye on yes, you, sir. Yes, so I just I will, will say be. stormy. Yes. It's just things stormy. are stormy. Uh, so the trial is going to set. It's going to start Monday. Yeah. Yes. And you're going. I am going. Yes. Are you pumped? I am pumped. Yes. Tell me why. Because it's a, this is the you know I mean like oh, the, the, this is like the OJ trial from 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 like we just talked about OJ I yeah. mean I would have that would have been cool to be actually be there but this isn't going to be on TV and but it's just jury selection next week but that'll be interesting because it'll it'll be interesting to see how people respond to the questions of can you be fair and do you know who the parties are can you talk about that the jury selection because this has become its own section of the trial that has its own well, level of intrigue and why. Is that well because look i mean in every jury trial you have to ask the people who are potential jurors like do you know the parties do you know the lawyers um and if it's a slip and fall case have you ever brought a slip and fall lawsuit and if so then so what happened and well i slipped and fell and i got 500 dollars or something like that and settlement and they'll say well does that prevent you from being fair in this case oh no 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 that doesn't prevent me so you you have that kind of questioning 
that's supposed to go on in every case, but it doesn't have to be as elaborate because usually when you're, you know, I remember I, I was once sworn in as a, as a juror in, 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 uh, in your county and it was a slip and fall case. I don't know why it, for some reason it was a bodega in Queens. I don't know why they sued in Manhattan, but okay. I mean, it's fine. And, um, no, I wouldn't, didn't know the parties. I didn't know the lawyers. I didn't know the, the bodega. But you are a lawyer. They let lawyers. This is, this is a stupid question. Yes. Lawyers can just be on Lawyers jurors. can be on jurors. It okay, used great. to be a long time ago, back when, probably 30 or 40 years ago, that lawyers would automatically get off. Uh-huh. Basically, anybody with a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a job could get off. And, I mean, this was, a, this was true in a lot of places. And you, you, could, you could get off so easily um, from jury duty. But then they realized, this is, this is, we're not getting, we need people who actually work to mm-hmm. be on juries because they actually know stuff. Um, we can't just have people who are, you know, have nothing else to do. Mm-hmm. And so I think there was this movement so um, decades ago, 20, 30, 40 years ago, to basically just, it's hard to get off of jury duty now. So even a lawyer, lawyers, it's easier for a lawyer to get off of jury duty, but it's not impossible. It's not, it's not automatic. Did you convict the slip and, well, it wouldn't be convict. Did no, you find we, in favor of the guy We didn't find and, anything at all. What happened was the case settled after the openings. Ah, uh, it's kind of a, it's kind of a letdown. Well, uh, it, it wasn't, well, I mean, it wasn't for me because it was basically, it was, just, was only a day out of my life. Yeah, I, sure. You it, got it, to go home. Right, I got to go home. But tell me if you, if you're Trump and if you're the other side that's not Trump. Uh, not Trump. What do you want from a jury? Um, well, if I'm I'm the prosecution, I want a, I want a smart jury. I want a I want a smart jury. I want a good cross section of the people in Manhattan, and I Who think that's will good. Understand it less for its salacious sort of framing, and more as a uh, as a what would it be like a corporate way of paying somebody off and yeah i mean the way look, the money moved, i i i, I, I like think Cohen. yeah I, I think for the defense the defense wants to sneak on somebody who doesn't care about the facts or the law and is willing to sort of entertain the notion that this is a witch hunt that they're and, going after him just because they don't like right. him politically and he now i don't know it. how exactly you can figure that out from the questions that are going to be asked but i mean i think that by and large um i think that i think the defense wants a dumber jury yeah okay so the prosecution wants a smart jury I, I, I mean but i, I again I'd, I'd i'd defer to people who have actually tried this kind of case in a white collar case in, in in manhattan in new york supreme all right well then instead of the jury what about what is what is the prosecution's strongest argument against Trump, and what's Trump's strongest defense? Yeah, the strongest are, I mean, look, I mean, the, the, the prosecution's case is very strong overall, and the strength of the case doesn't depend on any single witness. I mean, we're going to hear a lot about Michael Cohen, and Michael Cohen lied, and Michael Cohen did this, and he did this bad thing, but it doesn't really, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter, because it's a documentary evidence case. The evidence is going to be fundamentally not disputed that these payments were made, these payments went through, and that Trump reimbursed them, and that the material that the that they were recorded on the books of Trump corporate of, of, of the Trump organization falsely as legal fees, when in fact they weren't they weren't legal fees. Um, and I, I don't I don't they can't it's really going to be hard for um, Trump to get around that. Now the defense is going to be one that I, I, the defense will relate essentially to whether or not to a legal issue that determines whether or not this can be a felony. And let me see if I can unpack this in simple terms. The, <laughs> the statute that's involved is a statute that pro- prohibits the making of false, the fraudulent creation of business records, the making of false business records. And that is, I mean, there are different degrees, like, you know, like first degree murder. This is, this is a, this one is first degree falsification of a business record. And that requires in order for, for that, and that's a felony. If, it, for that to, to prove that, you have to prove not only that the, that the business record was made and that it was false, but that it was done in furtherance of some other crime. And so here, the other crime would be campaign finance 
a violation because it was done to support the campaign mm. and that would violate federal law. Mm -hmm. Now, his defense of that, which would kick it down to, a, if, if, if it's successful, would kick, kick these charges down to a misdemeanor. His defense is, oh, I did this because it, was, it wasn't because of the campaign. It was because I was afraid that Melania would get I mad at me. I want my wife to find right. out. Right. Yeah. And that's going to be his, that, that's going to be the defense, or the defense is actually going to be more like, you haven't proven that that's not the case. Because again, the prosecution has to prove it's kind everything of a good beyond defense. a reason. I mean, when I hear it, that. It, look, it. it it, if it, I were him, I'd be like, look, I've already told you, I think I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and wouldn't lose any voters. So it wasn't about the election. I just didn't want my wife and kid to well, find that, out. Well, and again, that, that's right. I mean, that, that that's like, but, but here's the thing. Apparently, there will be evidence that Melania already knew about oh. Stormy Daniels. Um, I, I've read that somewhere. I don't know what evidence they have about that. The other evidence is going to be that there was discussion um, among Trump and between Trump and Cohen of possibly trying to delay the payment until after the election so we could stiff her. Stiff, um, well, Stormy. that's the wrong word. Um, Stormy. Oh. Um, to, to, this is to, why to, you and Twitter I, are going to have to really... I was going to, there was another word I was going to use. I can't, there are no words. That, that she yeah. would, he, he, we would, um, gyps Stormy, I guess, would okay. be a good word. That's a safe word. Other than the words. I think it's probably politically incorrect about gypsies or something now too. Yes, but that's actually, right. I can't. I, I, I can't think you're win. canceled. I he think you're canceled. A, he, I'm canceled. That's yeah. okay. He did it in order to. Yeah, I forgot. That, yeah, that is a bad word. <laughs> I think that is the order. That's even worse. Is it? I. I don't really. You're right. No, you're right. It okay. is. It's. A, I apologize to 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 Roma. Yes. Um, no, but I mean, basically, to rip off Stormy or to trick her Good. into. That that's probably it. Yeah. Okay. So that's going to be. That, oh, wait, that, sorry, I got caught up in the. Right, ling, caught up in the, in, lingo. In the lingo. So, but what is the? If he was saying, if the argument was, uh, well, I was just gonna. Um, you're right. Actually, it is hard to think of a, a term. I was gonna. Um, screw. You see, you yeah, can't use screw. You can't mess screw, her over mess, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then, then what would? Who would that? That would be his defense. His no. His argument is going to be. It wasn't because of the election. It was because of the embarrassment generally. Right. And it was, you know, this is essentially the, the John Edwards defense. Right. But whose who's defense is that he wanted to delay the payment to get out of paying her? No, that's not a defense. That oh. is that is evidence that he only did it because of the, the election. election. I because see. it I the, because if that were true, if he, if he if he were willing not to pay the hush money after the election, um, and and and, ha and and he didn't care whether these allegations became public, mm -hmm. then that would show that it was it did have something to do with his campaign, and it was for the purpose of helping the campaign, and which would be a campaign finance violation, which would turn the business records charge into a felony. Oh, so you had originally said you thought this trial might go six weeks. That's I, again, I, I don't know for a fact i mean you can, trials are very unpredictable in terms of how long they are um it really depends on how the you know how the evidence shakes out and what how how tight the judge controls the courtroom but the, every estimate that i've heard is is around six weeks and is trump going to be like in the courtroom every day of that i don't know what did they what did they do i, I don't know i mean it's not it may not be the best thing for him to be in the courtroom because we saw what he did in the Eugene Carroll case. He cannot contain well, also himself. Also, I heard he's got another thing he's working on right now. So it seems like a tough use of his time to what? be in the court. What's the, what's the other thing? Running for president? Running for president. Yeah, yeah, it could be that. Um, but he doesn't have to be in the courtroom. He doesn't have to be in the courtroom every day. Well, I think there's days he has to. How is it that you can be central? Like you, it's central to a. I mean, he has. Like to, I mean, that, that's an in interesting court. question. I mean, the, the in a criminal case, the, the the accused has the right to be present, and the court could make could force him to be present every day. Um, I, I, I don't know how that's going to play out. Um, I don't think it's to his advantage for him to be in the courtroom because I think he can't help himself but to do things that would disrespect the court and the jury, as he did in the E. Jean Carroll case, which cost him a pretty substantial sum of money because they just saw his absolute contempt for the proceedings and the contempt for the plaintiff and contempt for everybody and everything that sort of, that was extremely consistent with the arguments, the factual and arguments that the plaintiff was making. 
Okay. So six weeks from now, we're in June ish, let's say, like after Memorial Day. Yep. Uh, and let's say he's convicted. Yes. Then what happens? He'll be sentenced. To what? Um, I don't remember what this. I, honestly, I don't remember what the what this. But there is it, it, there is a possibility of incarceration. If it's if he's convicted of oh, first of degree, first degree, don't you think though they'll look for a way? It just feels like what they do, right? It's like the with the bond going down to one seventy five. It's like they're looking for ways to achieve accountability, but without um, looking like they're coming down extra hard on him. He's not doing a very good job of seeking leniency in his with his behavior. Yeah, that's so true. I, you know, I, I, I is this it, where he's got a gag order. Yes, this is been, the one where he's got the gag yes. order, and he's complaining about it. And he, he tweeted, or not tweeted, he truth the uh, the other yeah, day sure. that I'm going to be in this courtroom gagged. It looked like he was going to be physically gagged. I mean, like, uh, so. okay. Um, all right. So, is there anything else in the Stormy case that you think uh, it's important for our listeners to understand? No, no. I think I think um, I think we covered it. Okay. Well, we will. I'll have more to say when I when yeah, next week. Yeah, you're gonna go. I'm gonna and then go, we're and gonna I'll, come back and break I'll it down for st- everybody. I'll probably have some good stories. Okay, you know. I can't wait for that. All right, so About pastrami sandwiches during lunch. You yeah. know whether there's you know where the good we delis want the, are. We want the color, like yeah, the color story. The courthouse is near Chinatown. There are a couple of good, great places of good get Peking duck down there. Oh, this sounds like just a real yeah. uh, exciting time for yeah. you. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited I'm for excited. you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the Supreme Court's going to hear oral arguments in the immunity case on April 25th. We're going to do a whole uh, <coughs> preview episode leading up to it. George, as always, thank you for explaining the legal news to me and to them. Thanks to everyone for listening. Don't forget to hit subscribe. Leave us a review on your podcast app. Email us at askgeorge at thebulwark.com and get tickets for our live show on May 15th in D.C. Come see us, but we'll see you next week. Well, George Conway, he's a man with a plan. Got to sit down with Sarah Longwell, take a stand, explain all the legal problems they're piling high. With Donald Trump, oh my, oh my, oh my. He said, Sarah, let me break it down for you. There's obstruction of justice, corruption to the legal tangles and troubles that are growing fast. It's a storm that's gonna last and last.